we are coming up to our next section, which is on impact inspiration and what other young people are doing. And as I'm sure you've, uh, you know, as I'm sure you've seen so far, we've actually had a lot of great speakers who, uh, who have also talked about um, their involvement within land care, and a lot of them from a young age. Uh, from you know, I myself have been involved since I was in primary school, and uh, you know. The most important, you know, one of some of the most important things from my experience have been the people who have actually helped shape my uh, my experience. Uh, for me, that was my mother, my uh, my la my local land care coordinator, and later on my uh, my uh, my professional mentor. So, but anyhow, this session's not about me. This session's about our wonderful speakers who are who are up next. So, our first one. Our first one in this session is Elliot Connor. So Elliot is the founder and CEO of Human Nature Projects, a podcaster and TED speaker, a UN consultant, a wildlife rescue and filmmaker, author, screenwriter and journalist. There's a few titles there. Having travelled far and wide, he now shares his love of wildlife through storytelling and mentors the next generation of conservationists as a member of the Coalition Wild Steering Committee. Elliot is joining us from overseas this morning to share with us the ABCs of transformative storytelling, which allow him to scale his own charity across over 100 countries, inspiring others in act, uh, to action. Over to you, Elliot. Cheers, Chris. Appreciate the intro. Right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Over the next nine minutes 50 seconds i'm going to do something very meta i'm going to teach you how to tell your story by telling you mine so buckle up because you're in for a ride my story begins many moons ago in the snow blanketed wintry expanse of southern france by day, I was caring for raptors, hawks and falcons, vultures and owls, in great grey hangers, straight out of Jurassic Park. By night, I was holed up in a 13th century castle, researching the work of the 200 largest environmental NGOs. See, I'd spent the past five years doing the old greeny frog march. Contacting charity after charity, trying to help, well, save the world. Only to find my hands tied by my youth. And everywhere I looked, I saw red tape. And it drove me mad. I mean, literally seeing red. What my research showed was that the larger these conservation charities grew, the less they were using volunteers. I mean, people like me, ordinary folks. What did I do? Of course, I started a charity of my own, Human Nature Projects, to support community-led wildlife conservation. I told my story a few thousand times and in the space of three months had scaled this little NGO across a hundred countries. Not bad for a 16 year old. But why tell stories? That's why. Because speaking is important. It's the simplest bit of magic you will ever learn. I mean, I did that and I was as shy as a star-nosed mole. My best friend was a stick insect, for God's sake. I tell stories because storytelling changes minds. Right now, our Aussie wildlife is headed for a 100 kilometre per hour collision with a 90 tonne road train we call the sixth mass extinction. And that's not a pretty sight. A new direction could have come soon enough. And because ostriches. 
That ostrich is most people you'll speak to. They might humour you, but secretly they're as stubborn as the folks that insist our Earth isn't balancing on the back of four large elephants. They've got a brain the size of a billiard ball and an attention span. Here's the good news. Like all great magic, there's a trick to telling stories. It comes down to A, B, C. I told you it was easy. How does one cast this easily spelt spell? How did I start my speech? With an anecdote. Because these are your stories. And they're the best you'll ever tell. Unlike break dancing and brain surgery, this is something robots can't do. So it humanizes you. And since evolution ensured we're not all total sociopaths. People are genetically programmed to listen to other human stories. Thank God. B is for bait. Your ostrich audience is listening. Now you make them care. This story is a conversation. If you know your audience, you might link to something you know they know and love, bridging your passion and theirs. If not, ask, take a gamble, but give them something they can relate to. You want to be A, B, C, body. For instance, hands up who here likes games? Yes. Okay, hands up who here can raise their hand? Who here thinks I can't see people raising their hands through this miracle of Zoom? Well, here's a game anyway. Up on the screen, you'll see the numbers one through nine randomly positioned. All you need to do is remember where they are. See, a big part of what I try to do in my work is to persuade ostrich people that animals are just as smart and special as they are. That's long enough. Hands up if you can tell me where one was. Who? How about five? Seven, nine. Well, with my Zoom x ray vision, I'd put a large amount of money on the fact that very few of you got all nine. See, that same test is used by researchers at Kyoto University. On a nine year old chimp named Ayumu, he does it in a fraction of a second. And he still gets it right almost every time. Turns out chimpanzees crush humans at working memory tests. Just one more way nature's smarter than we are. But where does that leave us? High and dry? Nope, because story sense is as easy as alphabeti spaghetti. We've got A, B, C completes the charm. C is for collect, gathering it all in with a call to action. I've told you my tale. I've given you a peek inside our human brains. You are all now certified Ost witches and wizards. So go for, share your story and 
build an army like I did, if you fancy it. 90 years ago, in 1932, 20,000 emus were raiding Aussie farms. The government declared war, sending a troop of World War I veterans after them with mounted machine guns. It lasted less than a month before the military beat a tactical retreat. The emus had won, and so can you. If you inspire and emus those ostriches, which humour you, show an ostrich a graph and, well, it just won't fly. But sprinkle in a little story sense, A, B, C, spaghetti, and suddenly you're spinning that big bird's world, letting it dance to your tune. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elliot, for that. Uh, I think uh, I think you'd be able to go toe to toe with David Amber one day with all that. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have time for um, for questions, guys. So look, we're going to keep moving on to the to our next speakers. Uh, so our next one here is joining us in person today is Spencer Hitchin. At only 11 years old, Spencer is a, is a young conservationist who stands up for the rights of nature and future generations. He is a runner up in the Les Hall Les, Les Hall Young Conservation Award 2022. He was a runner-up in 2019 for the Holmes Junior Art Prize for Realist Australia Art, Alberta, and a finalist one year later. A runner-up in the World Kangaroo Day Photo Competition, and many more. Right now, Spencer is doing his best to protect 5.8 hectares of glossy black cockatoo habitat on Sunrise Beach. Unfortunately, developers don't quite understand the concept of prime real estate. So Spencer joins us here in Sydney today and will share, to, uh, share with us tips for standing up for nature. How are you, Spencer? and I am trying to save Sunrise Glossies in my local area. So I've always loved the environment since I was born so I would pick up different things and take them home and observe birds and animals and plants and pick up rubbish since I was extremely young and I love birds so they're my favourite things to photograph now and they were my favourite things to observe as well. So. And then I wanted to learn about plants and the relationships between animals and plants and all sorts of creatures. So then I went to my local botany group and I was taught all about plants and animals and I've learned all about the natural world. And I used to draw what I was seeing so if you see like birds or fungi or plants or anything and you don't know what it is, if you draw it and then you can remember what it looks like and then you can show people and they might be able to identify it to you. So that's what I used to do. And now I've got my camera, I can photograph birds and things and all environment I love photographing and then I teach people about these amazing creatures and how we need to protect them so the first time I ever saw the glossy black cockatoos which is the bird that I'm 
specifically trying to protect at Grass Tree Court Sunrise Beach, which is the Wallam Woodland. And I saw them when I was about two years old the first time and we were walking through my local area and they were feeding up in some cash arenas. And then when I was older, I met Glossy Bob. I went to my local environment group and he taught me all about the glossies and he made me fall in love with them and then I wanted to protect them. And Bob and Isabel Pert and a lot of other people have been observing the glossies and teaching people about them for 25 plus years. So they know, really know our glossies in the local area. And then I can photograph the glossies as well. So I can identify each female glossy is different. So I can identify them. And you can see the birds on the screen here. They are the Tifa 2 birds, which were the first birds that really I started to protect their habitat with. So I was observing these birds it, sitting in the tree feeding on the Cacharinas, Alacacharina littoralis or black she-oak, when Bob told me that the tree along with the whole forest was going to be destroyed. So I knew I must protect them and teach people about them. So this is that photograph that I took on that day. So these are the glossies, so you can see a bit more about them. So the male, you can see there, it has the red tail panels and that's the adult male. And then the female has the yellow on the head and orange, red to yellow varies tail panels. And then you can see in the bottom corner the glossy pair and you can see the yellow on the head clearly there and that's the tea for two birds and they've just been and they've just been listed on the epbc act which i'll tell you a little bit more about that soon so the life cycle of the black she oak so that's the glossy's food source so you can see there, and I won't go too much into that because I haven't got too much time, but you can come back to this and have a look at it later if you would like. So this is the Wallum ecosystem. So you can see the Wallum woodland there. That's the main ecosystem that the glossies feed in in my local area and then all the other wallam ecosystems there you've got the dry heath the wet heath the sedge land where the sedge frogs live and then the melaleuca woodlands and the wallam is a really amazing biodiverse ecosystem so you can just see here just a tiny snapshot of some of the creatures that live in the Wallam. So it's a really beautiful, amazing place. And we really need to protect it because the more times we put in developments and we don't care for the Wallam, then the more it will go extinct. So these are just three of the threatened species in the Wallum. So you can see the ground parrots and then in the middle, the Christmas bells. And then on the outside, on the other side, the sedge frog, Wallum sedge frog, and they're all threatened species. So this is really important for the threatened species. And the habitat that I'm trying to protect is acts as like a border 
to the wet heath. So the Wallam woodland protects the wet heath from sewerage or like runoff from developments and things. So as soon as this, if it gets developed, then the species that live in the wet heath down the bottom will be affected and will be driven out of this area. So there's runoff and down effects from one site being developed. So it might just be one area, but it affects all everywhere around it. And I found through my journey that all of our Australian plants and animals and all other creatures are threatened with extinction because of our weak environment laws. So I have been trying with a lot of other people to strengthen these environmental laws so that the environment will be protected for the future of the planet and future generations. And the glossies have just been listed under the EPBC Act, which is really great news because it gives the glossies better protection. And I have, this is how I started. So I started by observing and then I learned about ecosystems and everything. And then I protected it because I knew I had to protect it or there'd be nothing left. So I believe that if we don't all stand up against climate change and destruction of habitat, and all that, then we will lose our all our amazing species and we'll lose our beautiful planet. So I Spencer didn't didn't realize you'd finished, but uh, that was that was a really that was actually really gripping uh, storytelling there of, of, of your of your life to now. This is um, you know, fills me with actually a lot of hope and reminds me of uh, my 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 younger years. I'm old saying that. Um, <laughs> so um, now look, guys, we are going to go for a five minute break just to get up and stretch. I need to get up, and now we're going to play another game of musical chairs over here. Uh, so maybe I'll see you soon, maybe not, but um, see you in five minutes, guys. Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you've uh, hope you've all managed to uh, stretch those legs. For the schools joining us, how is my captive audience? All right, so we'll keep going on with our speakers. So our next one is Patrick Twig. So 12 years of age, Patrick is a passionate young farmer, composter and nature lover. Amazingly, he has actually designed and developed his own homegrown projects, including his own native paddock, a composting system and a worm farm. The driving force behind all of this, of course, is quite simply improving soil health, sustainable food production, and creating healthy habitat for wildlife. Today, he is sharing his story with the hopes of inspiring more young people to take simple, easy steps toward living uh, in a more environmentally friendly and sustainable life. Over to you, Patrick. Hello, my name is Patrick. I'm M from Cowra. I have four little projects going at home, three major and one small project. I have my Australian native paddock, my large composting system, my worm farms, and my very own veggie patch. The three choices of plants were a gum tree, a wattle, and a river bottle brush. This is not my flower, but that's what it'll look like. The 
The area was full of weeds. We cleaned up the site and leveled it with the excavator. Then we started to plant the plants. I'll talk about a few of my favorites in the upcoming slides. The reason I chose some of these plants were either for their looks or the species of bees, butterflies, birds that they will attract. I have put mulch down to suppress weed and weed seed germination. Mulch is also useful to stop drying soil drying out, improve soil quality and protect against severe temperature changes. I currently have two species of euphorbia. There are five native species to Australia. They both grow 60 centimetres high and wide. The sap is poisonous. Their flowers look like their leaves. Banksia roller coaster. This is a ground cover plant. It has serrated leaves, but they will not cut you. Airy wattle. This plant is only new to my collection. It is a weeping wattle. It will grow five meters high and three meters wide. Queensland bottle tree. It will start to form its bowl at eight to 10 years. It will grow 18 to 20 meters high and five to 12 meters wide, but in cooler climates, 12 to 15 meters high. Moonlight Grafilia. This is my most favourite plant because of its flowers. It has white cream flowers. It attracts bees and birds. And it will, it's very fast growing. It will grow five metres high and two to four metres wide. Garden Birdia. It is a very fast native climber. It produces vibrant purple flowers but it can also, there are different varieties that can produce white or pink flowers. Reveal your superb. It produces very nice two-toned colored flowers. It is great for a table decoration. It'll grow 1.5 meters high and wide. I try not to use chemicals, so I've researched the best tools for the job. I mostly use my Dutch hoe and steer up hoe. Once I started my first small compost, I enjoyed watching the food scraps turn into compost. I enjoyed building the compost base with my grandpa. We used recycled materials of tins and pellets. We built the bait compost base in less than a day. I researched what can and can't go into the compost for the best result. And I use different layers to make it decompose properly. I follow no dig garden blog. This bay was started in March this year. It is maturing really well. It's still like soil, but still has a while to go. This bay was started in May. I'm using a compost aerator to help speed up the composting process. This is a corkscrew compost aerator. As you can see, it still has a lot more time to mature. This is my newest bay. 
And as you can see, I'm still in the process of building it up. I'm putting fertilizer on it to help with the nutrient. These are the worm farm. Once, when the worms are bred, once they will be put into the compost to help speed up the composting process. Earthworms and compost worms are different. Compost worms will eat half their body weight every day. Worm juice can be diluted one to ten with water to be used as to be used as a fertilizer on the garden. My family has a veggie garden, but I wanted my own so I could say I've grown that. I I plant what's in season. I have a hanging basket to maximize space. I have carrots, kale, peas, broad beans, and red cabbages in. I have also planted flowers to help with keep pests away and with aid help with, aid, with pollination. What we do matters, even the small things. Start small and keep adding to it. Plant something you like to look of or like to eat. Read and research about it. Ask a family member or friend. It's much more fun when there's someone else involved. Things will die and that's okay. Try again. Thank you very much for that, Patrick. Um, yeah, a lot of, if someone's so young, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of really, a lot of good knowledge there. Um, I'm actually, you know, I'm actually working, uh, working, uh, 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 working for a living and uh, doing a lot of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, look, uh, we do have a little bit of time for, um, for some questions. So I've got one here for you, um, Patrick, if you're still with us. Um, so we've got one question here from Christine. How do you know when the compost is ready? It will, you will start to, um, so it should be nice and crumbly, not like shouldn't stick together. Okay. Move on. So that's all. That's all the uh, all the questions we have time for, unfortunately. So our next our next speaker, guys, is actually uh, from Christmas Island District High School. So on Christmas Island each year, a group of Year Nine and Ten students hit the beach to protect Christmas Island's unique environment and wildlife. One of the biggest threats is marine debris. Truly, it will put a damper on any Christmas celebration. Greta Beach is an important turtle nesting beach on the island, is one of the beaches most heavily impacted by tons of marine debris from March, and uh, to, between uh, March and November, sorry. This also affects the quality of the beach for young people to enjoy because it is polluted. So uh, uh, Ayu is here to share about these, new, uh, about these students, uh, how they're protecting wildlife and looking after the places they love. Over to you. Hi, so thank you. Oh, yeah, how do you? Yeah, okay. So Christmas Island is the peak of a basalt volcano seamount, which rose steeply 5,000 meters from the ocean floor about 60 million years ago. When most people think of a tropical island, they think of kilometers of beaches. However, we have less than 10 beaches on the island. Most of our, most of our coastline is made up of rocky cliffs that meet the ocean. So we only have two beaches that have enough sand um, for turtles to lay their eggs. Green turtles return all year round to Greta and Dolly Beach. We know this as we see evidence of their body pits. We find discarded turtle eggs and we also see the turtles returning. And if we are lucky, we happen to see the turtle hatch things making their way to the ocean. Each year between March and November, huge amounts of marine debris washes up on Christmas Island. This year, we planned our annual marine debris audit in June. However, we had to postpone this as we had a COVID outbreak for the first time on Christmas Island, and many of the students and teachers were sick or considered close contacts and in isolation. So this year, we are planning on doing our marine debris audit in October. This year, 
has been the worst year we have seen for marine debris. It has become a rite, a rite of passage for year 10s to organize and lead the marine debris audits of Greta Beach. We have been doing this now for over seven years as a group of students. This year, it was my turn to be the leader of this project. Oh, wait. As a leader, I felt nervous, even anxious about the enormity of this task. However, as I took on the leadership, I realized how much joy it did bring me to care for our environment, to lead others and work with different community groups and organizations. It felt good to be a part of a team, to be significant in making a difference to our, to our environment on Christmas Island. I lead our year 10 team to liaise with organizations such as Parks of Australia, um, to talk about the best time with tides, etc., to burn the wood that washes up. The wood can really inhibit green turtles from being able to access the sand to create their body pits for the turtle eggs. We also liaise with the Australian Federal Police, who accompanies us and takes us through the jungle in the police car. Some other organizations we also lies with is the Christmas Island Shire, who provide the, who provide the bags for collection and take the marine debris to our landfill site when we finish. And the Australian Defence Force and Border Force are also present in the waters around Christmas Island. Each year, we invite them to help us with the removal of the marine debris. Some years they can join us and others they can't. It is great when they can join us as they are usually very fit. We also invite community members to join us on the day via advertising on our community blackboard. On the day we start school later, and that is because Greta Beach has full sun in the morning. In previous years, we have had people faint and become dehydrated. This is why we don't start until 11 a.m when the cliffs of Greta Beach give us shade to work. We allocate people to collect specific items depending on what washes up. Common items are straws, bottle caps, plastic bottles, toothbrushes, foam, and thongs. Someone is also allocated to plastic toys and items asked by our art teacher and local artists. We also keep certain plastics aside to be recycled um, by EcoCrab for plastic waste processing. This, is, this organization can repurpose the plastic waste into tables and other items. We weigh the marine debris, we count the marine debris, and we remove the marine, we remove, remove the marine debris. The result is, that Greta Beach is cleared of bulky and large marine debris. Our green turtles can hopefully then access the sand to lay the eggs. We also remove the debris to ensure the rubber crabs and hermit crabs have access to the intertidal zone without rubbish. For example, the hermit crabs often use bottle caps instead of shells as they can't access the shells that washes up on the, with all the debris present. Unfortunately, some years it doesn't take long for the marine debris to really impact the beach again. The problem is that the rubbish mostly comes from Indonesia. We need change to happen there so that we can have pristine beaches for our community and creatures that live or use Christmas Island. We collect data to make our message more powerful. We work with Tangora Blue, to lobby governments in Australia and Indonesia. We make a film each year and publish this on our Facebook page.
And so pretty much we're going down to Greta Beach and we're... Over the past seven years, this is our average amount of marine debris we removed from 1,070 meters squared of land. I struggle with putting my hand up to take the lead. I feel nervous and anxious about talking in front of people um, or asking them to action tasks. My advice is to challenge yourself to put up your hand. Once I started leading this task, I felt relief, I felt excited, and I felt more confident and comfortable. It is why I put my hand up to be a part of this forum to share our work on Christmas Island and get our message out. It has been our goal for seven years to reach as many people as possible via our YouTube videos and our Facebook page. So today, I am being part of a new way to get our message out and it's exciting to, part, to be a part of this forum today and help awareness of our issue on Christmas Island Grove. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ayu. That's, um, that was a really inspirational story and um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the hardest, you know, the hardest part of, of uh, getting, you know, making it, making any change is is starting the process and putting your hand up. So thank you very much for sharing that. We've really enjoyed having you here. Our next speaker is this bloke. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Jaden Gunn. So Jaden Gunn works for BirdLife Australia and has been an active member of Intrepid Landcare since the beginning of 2019. Jaden is a young freelance wildlife photographer and a dedicated environmental educator. Hailing from the Wiradjuri land in Cowra, New South Wales, he enjoys spending most of his time uh, introducing people to Australia's unique wildlife through digital storytelling paired with the photographs he captures. What sets Jaden apart from many others is his com a comprehensive knowledge of agricultural husbandry, birds, in his spare time, he uses this knowledge to help rehabilitate sick and injured wildlife um, and breed rare and threatened Australian birds. I am convinced he is trying to build an ark, although I don't think Noah would approve of his birds only policy. Jaden will share how feel, uh, following your passion can lead to the most incredible opportunities and what that would mean. How about you, mate? Is it going? Yep, get everyone. <clears throat> so yeah, my name's Jaden Gunn, and today I'm going to have a bit of a chat to you about a land care pathway. Um, I utilise a land care pathway um, in a non-traditional way to foster my passion, develop my knowledge, and achieve my dreams. And the best part is you can too. As a young kid, I was always inspired by the environment. Um, really passionate about animals. I used to go around and fiddle with every bit of animal I could, birds, reptiles, you name it. And coming from New Zealand, um, where I moved to Australia in 2004, we didn't have quite, we've got quite a bit of quite a diversity of animals, but I was just absolutely in, in, amazed by the bird life and the reptile life that was present here in Australia. Um, I didn't have much of an outlet or a pathway set before me to, to navigate my passion or many people mentoring me in my passion. So I was absolutely wrapped when I would, when I turned about 16 years old, I was approached by uh, Landcare at school. And that my first ever experience with Landcare was going out to see species that not many people ever actually get to see in person. Um, I went out on a tour and got to see and check nest boxes for squirrel gliders, which are just an incredible species. Um, I can't tell what slide we're on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right here. Yeah, so when I was growing up as well, so I went from 15 and then um, started keeping and breeding a lot of na uh, native Australian bird life and reptiles. And as I said, I didn't really have much of an outlet until Landcare found me. Um, and they really nurtured my my passion and my um my want to do something greater. And I was I was breeding these bird species, these threatened bird species, and I really wanted to do more, but I didn't know how to contribute or, ha or have the confidence, confidence to do so. So Landcare can provide you with a wealth of opportunities and critical experience to turn your passion and um, 
really like a like a diamond in a rough really um, refine what you are capable of doing and achieving. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to try exciting new activities, um, endless expansion of knowledge, and you can use these skills and experience. Uh, the skills and experience you develop with Landcare to find work in the conservation land management industry later in life or just around the corner for those of you who are in your later years of schooling. Um, that's exactly what I did. So I didn't take a, a standardised path through tertiary education. I didn't go to university, but I really um, engaged with Landcare and they, they helped provide me with the skills and experience um, and built my capacity to be able to to actually, and my confidence as well, to be able to contribute to the work that I'm most passionate about. And now I work in a scientific role with BirdLife Australia, which is an absolute dream come true, especially for someone without a university. So connect with like-minded people and established networks. This has been probably one of the most valuable things that I've ever learnt. I've always been quite self-kept and shy and, um, enjoyed spending my time out in nature but when I got to do that with other people who were also like-minded um, was when my ability and my capacity to actually contribute um, in a meaningful way to the things that I'm most passionate about is when um, I really really started to develop and really grow um, and give back in the ways that I'd wanted to. So Intrepid Landcare um, has been a really, a really big motivator for me. Um, I was introduced to them in 2019 by one of the co-founders, Naomi, um, who is just an incredibly inspiring uh, and enthusiastic person. And she really uh, brought me out of my shell and come and found me at one of the, at the Landcare conference. And I was, yeah, like I said, I was incredibly shy and I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but she made that event really easy for me. And then to go from that into um, being able to give back to people the same way that she did the, for me that day has been really inspiring. And it's just um, the blank air is like a family. It's, 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 it's safe. It's a really safe place to develop and grow. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, and any contribution is, it, it feels needed and wanted. So foster your passion and feed your curiosity. Uh, as a young person, your curiosity and your passion are two of the most incredible things that you possess. Uh, they can lead you anywhere, wherever you want to go, as long as you follow them and you stick to them. Your passion will set out a path before you and your curiosity will lead you down it. It is a dark and uncertain road to follow one's passion, but knowledge provides clarity in the dark and it is a light that shines brighter with each lesson learned. Take advantage of the age of information. Young people today, you, you've got Google and I know you may see people complain about Google experts on the internet, but you really have access to an un, unlimited amount of information, more than you could ever begin to, um, to read. Like there's, there's so much and you can find anything you've ever wanted to know uh, on there. Um, you, you've got access to social media, you've got your heroes. That's exactly what I did as I reached out to people who I'd seen on television, who I'd seen doing the things that I'd love doing. And you'd be surprised to know that they'll, they're willing to help. They want to help. Um, they, they're in the same place as you once. So any opportunity um, or even reach out to people like myself, any opportunity to help is, is it, it's an honour. Um, if you're passionate about something, chase it to the ends of the earth. That's exactly what I did. I never gave up um, despite being told and um, being afraid and, you know, just uh, uncertain times and not knowing if it, you're ever going to get to that light at the end of the tunnel or um, it's just, it's been a really long journey, but I, I'm safe. To, I'm, I'm glad to say that I made it and like I've achieved my dreams and any one of you can as well. The environment is an endless road of knowledge. We definitely know a lot about nature, but this the thing I love about nature um, is that we don't know near, anywhere near anything. Um, there's so much more to be learned. There's new plants being discovered. There's new 
species of animal and insects being discovered daily, discovered daily. So it's it's just this endless wealth of knowledge, this big pit that you can just dive down forever. Uh, Lanka is a great place to foster your, foster your passion, feed your curiosity and develop your knowledge. So just like you, I started out young. Uh, there's a picture of me on the right, um, nurturing a seagull. And I turned my passion and well, my, my passion and ex oh, my passion was shaped by Landcare and um, nurtured and now I'm able to give back in the way that it helped supported me, uh, support me and give back to me. It gave to me, sorry. One of the most important things while living out your passion um, and chasing your dreams is to have fun. So this is us, the Intrepid Landcare Board, um, on a bushwalk through some of the Gold Coast hinterlands. It's an absolutely beautiful part of the country, and um, I'm I'm honoured to be able to to be able to spend time with these people and in nature uh, together. And we have heaps of fun. It's what we really aim to do. So I'm going to leave you all with a quote. Plant trees of which, whose shade you do not expect to sit. Thank you. Thanks, Jaden, for that really inspirational thing. And uh, he's, you know, he's, he's right. There are many, there are many pathways out there for people to take. There's no, there's no one size fits all. Each of us walk, walk, uh, walk a different track of life. Okay, and for whatever your interests are out there, um, chat. You know, the important thing is to speak up and talk to others and find out which pathway is best for you. All right. <laughs> Our next speaker here is Gabriel Stacey. So Gabriel Stacey is a conservationist, botanist, and land care coordinator of, uh, ooh, might have to correct me on this one, but uh, Mulibimba, Newcastle, New South Wales. Working for the Hunter Region Land Care Network as a project officer, Gabby facilitates conservation events and engages with the community to raise awareness of and participation in land care. In addition to her work in the Hunter Region Land Care Network, she is a coordinator of Fern Creek Land Care and is also a coordinating member of, of uh, Hunter Intrepid Land Care. In 2021, Gabby was awarded the Young Land Care Leadership Award in the Hunter Region in recognition of her awesome efforts. Truly, in her own words, she is a mad dog. <laughs> Gabby is here with us today to talk about her journey into land care, uncovering new passions and skills and finding her niche in the industry. Gabby, take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me. I'll just start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on and the land on which I work, which are the Gadigal, Awabagal, Waramai and Wanarua people. I'd also like to acknowledge that land care should centre the voices of First Nations and, and their knowledge, and I extend my respects to all Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. So that's me in the waddle there. Next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my journey into land care and how I found my passion, my skills and work in the industry, as well as my niche. Sorry, the slides are a little bit slow. There we go. So as mentioned, I'm a project officer for the Hunter Region Land Care Network, which is a land care body that extends over the entirety of the Hunter Region. Um, there, I do a lot of work with not just plants or land care on the ground, but I also raise awareness for birds, frogs, animals, threatened species. I'm also the coordinator of Fern Creek Land Care which is in Dudley. We work on a Wabakal country um, and that's really close to where I grow up. So I just love that piece of land. And I'm also a coordinating member of Hunter Intrepid Land Care, which is the Hunter chapter of the Intrepid Land Care body that we were talking about today. So all of these groups interact together. Um, we collaborate on projects, but specifically the one on the right there, that's Hunter Intrepid Land Care. We do a lot more stuff with youth, but my entire purpose in the industry is to increase youth engagement as a whole and get more of you out there on the ground. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey into land care specifically. Um, the story starts in 2014. Um, I was traveling 
all around the place in Southeast Asia and Asia. Um, and I was actually teaching English in Vietnam. So I spent a few years um, overseas. And this is what my life looked like. I was riding around on a motorbike, teaching kids, and I had no idea about land care. So in 2016, I came back to Australia and I was really suffering with a whole lot of mental health issues. I mean, I have my whole life, but on the back of a really awful relationship and I just needed to reconnect with my home country, my hometown, and honestly rebuild my entire sense of self from the ground up. So I mucked around a little bit and then I got into horticulture just on a whim. I just started studying horticulture because I was like, I like plants started working in a nursery and then for me it was just such a natural progression into conservation um, the thing that really did it though was I went to at the end of 2018 I went to a retreat the intrepid land care leadership retreat on the central coast and that's where I met these guys that's where I met Megan and they gave me a really healthy push into really studying conservation so that was the next thing that I studied at TAFE and then after that, I joined Fern Creek Landcare, which is the group I was talking about that works in Dudley. Now, the reason I joined that group is because when I was really struggling, um, when I came back to Australia, I really needed to connect with my country, my hometown and rebuild. So I would just wander around all day barefoot, um, picking up rubbish and looking at the flowers. So I had, um, I really consider that place an important piece of, of my healing and getting to know myself again. So when, once I got into land care and started to apply my skills, um, I really just needed to work in Dudley. So now um, I'm a conservationist, volunteer coordinator, botanist, horticulturalist, nursery hand and ecology assistant. Um, as I said, my entire thing is engaging youth in land care. I like to connect experts with volunteers. Um, I've created an intergenerational partnership in my land care group, which I'll talk a bit more about. And my ethos is volunteers should leave feeling appreciated, fulfilled and richer than when they arrived. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my land care group, Fern Creek. So on the left there, you'll see the Squirrel Glider, which is um, the project that we did in 2020. And there, the older guy is my predecessor, Peter. So by creating a partnership with him and really learning with him and stepping up into a role of coordinator, I transformed the group um, in the slides that we'll see coming up. I, through my work with Fern Creek Landcare, getting it on socials, Instagram, Facebook, etc., getting a bit of um, graphic design going and, um, digital promotion, I was able to turn the group around, expand it by 500%. And I actually dropped the average age of land carers from over 50 to less than 30. So that was just phenomenal. And now we just have an absolutely great time. So there on the on the right there, you'll see kind of half a dozen people and I ex actually expanded into looking more like these other um, more youthful groups that you'll see. So I really insist that you, it's been really successful for me to engage with existing organisations. So if you have an interest or an area of concern or a species of concern or a connection to your local bushland, go through some of these um, existing organisations, whether it's national parks, your local land care coordinator, um, intrepid land care in your region or local land services. As a young person, I think that that can make the task a little less overwhelming because it was really successful to jump in on something that was already in existence. There was contacts, a little bit of funding, um, established networks and volunteers already involved. And beyond that, there was an incredibly experienced and knowledgeable pool of older people who were willing to share their knowledge with me. And that's what I talk about a little bit more tomorrow with the intergenerational partnerships. But if you're excited, get out there and expose yourself to the people who know these things on the ground. And as I said, it can make um, the idea of getting involved a little less overwhelming. Now, to be perfectly honest, looking back on my land care journey, um, I think the plants saved my life and I think that land care made it better. And I just want all of you to get out there 
and have land care make your life better as well. But you might be thinking, how can I do that? So I made this infographic because this is the way that I see it. And I'm going to talk you through a little bit, but I want you to have a picture of this in your mind and think about the ways in which you can um, engage with your interests or your skills because young people are so skilled these days, more skilled than any other generations before you, and how you can actually apply pretty much anything to conservation if you get a little bit creative. So in the middle here, it says conservation action, actions. But we look at these three circles and there's hands-on, community and education. So hands-on might be things like gardening, planting native species, pulling out weeds, boots on the ground, really getting dirty type of um, engagement. And that, that was my access into, into land care. As I said, I just love plants. Now community, that could be fundraising, raising awareness, um, advertising for causes, um, maybe cleanups. And as you can see, all of these things interact together. So cleanups could be hands-on and community combination. And then we look at education, that's that yellow circle. So that might be cultural education or educating yourself, watching documentaries, educating others, um, having those conversations with the people that are close to you. Um, and that also is citizen science, going out and collecting data out in your backyard. As you can see, they all interact together. But what I want to talk about is this white circle behind you. And that is the things that aren't quite as obviously related to conservation, but many of my previous speakers actually touched on them. So you young kids, you are just intuitive with content creation, digital assets, whether it's social media or article writing, taking pictures or videos and online presence. You guys just know how to do that intuitively. So you can think about the ways, maybe you don't want to get your hands dirty at all. Maybe you're an incredible writer. Go out there, engage with those existing organizations and offer them your skills because they need it. This is the way that land care is going. Um, you know, maybe you're an artist and, or you're a gun um, graphic designer. Go out there, offer those skills to the local groups and you can actually help to increase conservation and support conservation in so many ways. I really want you guys to just take away that land care actually really needs you. You're all the future leaders of land care and we need your youth skills, passion and innovation to keep going in this difficult time. And look, hopefully you can be as happy as I was in that tree by engaging with conservation. So I leave you just with thank you all so much for having me. These are my contact details. Um, that's my land care group, Fern Creek Land Care. These are my socials. If you want to chat, if you want to check out my um, check out our causes, some videos and photos, please jump on. But good luck and thank you. Thank you very much for that, Gabby. Um, Gabby is definitely right, guys. Uh, you guys are very passionate, um, and we, you know, truth be told. We do actually, you know, uh, quite a few of us, but especially the older, the older folk, do really, do really need young people, you know, young people uh, becoming involved because it actually helps keep us going too, makes it all worth the while to us. So moving on to our final, to our final guest speaker, we have Brentwood Secondary College, the Green Team. So the Brentwood Secondary College is located in Glen Waverley in Victoria. It's a five-star resource smart school catering to the educational needs of years twelve to uh, years seven to twelve students. Sorry, since nineteen sixty nine, Brentwood's towards zero emissions project was awarded the Premier Sustainability Award in twenty twenty one and the Resource Smart School of the Year Award in twenty twenty two. The project is entirely student driven and the re um, driven by the Brentwood Green team and demonstrates a strong commitment to, to, to taking immediate action on climate change. As I'm sure you'll know to find out, the group, the, you know, the, uh, the group seems very inspirational and it doesn't appear that they have any, uh, any plans for an exit at this stage, probably because Brexit has already been taken and over. The Green team will now share how young people make a difference and that change is possible and how schools can improve their sustainability practices and reduce their environmental footprint. Thank you, Brentwood. Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, we cannot build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. Hello, everyone. We are from the Green team at Brentwood Secondary College, Glen Waverley. We're here to share with you our Towards Zero Permissions campaign and hopefully inspire you to take action on climate change at your schools. Years ago, we asked ourselves, 
where should we start? And say, where are you from like this to get ideas from? Yeah. Yeah. Brentwood is a co-educational secondary college established 50 years ago. We're a big school comprising of nearly 1,650 students and 160 staff. Luckily, we have an active green team that has helped the college achieve the five-star resource smart school status, won the Premier Sustainability Award in 2021, and the resource smart school year of the award this year. Our projects aim to address the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. In our presentation today, we'll start by looking at Brentwood's Remissions Project, and then we'll then cover the key progress that Brentwood has made in the four resource smart modules. Today, we'll start with Remissions, or the greenhouse gas emissions created by Brentwood Secondary. One of our notable skills is our puns and play on words. A few years ago, we realised that through data that we already had and that wasn't being used that much, we could quite simply calculate the emissions that we produced each year. Similarly, we moved on to use this concept to calculate the amount of carbon emissions that were not being emitted or being reduced, for example, through recycling or through tree planting. So this table here is what we call our conversion factors. So these are what we use to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions and offsets. So for example, electricity is 1.17 kilograms per kilowatt hour. We multiply our electricity usage in kilowatt hours to find out how much carbon is emitted in kilograms. This same applies for offsets. So in Victoria, paper and cardboard going to landfill would create 2.9 kilograms of carbon emissions. By diverting this to recycling, we can multiply the amount of paper and cardboard that we've sent to recycling, so this is data from our provider, by 2.9 to find out how much emissions we have prevented. This table here is um, our permissions data from the past few years. And as you can see, there's a significant reduction in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the past five years in electricity, gas, paper, and general waste. The numbers in red at the bottom are the total emissions for each year. It has decreased from 690 tonnes to 541 tonnes over the past five years, which is a 23% decrease. At the bottom, we also have the data for emissions reductions and offsets. So these are calculated using that same tool before. Overall, Brentwood's emissions have been decreasing every year and emissions offsets have been steadily increasing at the same time. Reducing and offsetting for emissions. A significant amount of our emissions are reduced due to a combined total of 97.9 kilowatts of solar PV system on our roofs. This caters to 40% of our electrical usage and reduces our CO2 emissions by 134 tonnes every year. Up to 100 native trees are planted on our college grounds every year. Furthermore, the Green Team has planted over 600 trees on the Mornington Peninsula in 2021 and over 1,500 saplings along the Scotchman's Creek in 2021 and 2022. On-site tree planting is expected to offset nearly 25 tonnes of emissions annually. Over the past few years, Brentwood has launched nine streams of waste management. This system captures all types of waste produced on-site. In addition to the standard commingled stream, we recycle textbooks, coffee cups, used batteries, old clothes, and electricals. Recycling offsets nearly 25 tonnes of emissions each year. Compostable cutlery is used at our college canteen. In 2020, we launched, a, we launched compost cattles in most of our offices. Brentwood Secondary College launched the Towards Zero Remissions Initiative in 2020. This, this initi initiative intends to reduce Brentwood's greenhouse gas emissions from the current 540 tons to zero in the next, in the next eight years. 
Brentwood hopes to become a pioneer school in Victoria to address climate change by taking action. The Toward Zero Emissions target is aligned with Victoria's climate change strategy and circular economy policy. Brentwood's emissions dropped by nearly 23% from 2016 to 2019. We are hoping to sustain and slash improve by, for, by switching completely to renewable energy by 2025. The Victorian government has announced that recently that all government buildings are going to run on renewable energy by 2025. We are optimistic that this strategy will significantly reduce our emissions in the future. Brentwood is going to host and participate in several tree planting events at this college and in our community in the future. Our aim is to increase the natural carbon sinks. Brentwood is going to host and participate in several tree planting events at the college. Brentwood is hopeful that the container deposit scheme and purple recycling bins to be introduced in the next two years will be another addition to our already diverse recycling program. Bentwood will participate in community awareness programs such as this youth forum to gain strength and momentum to mitigate or reverse the impacts of climate change. We will strengthen our Meat Free Mondays campaign further in the future. Now we would like to present some of the significant projects and progress in each of our RSS modules. All of this information, including more ideas, can be found on our website, which will be shown at the end. At Brentwood, we aim to make our events sustainable and incorporate behaviour change by organising Brentwood Cleanup Day every year. Commingled recycling bins have been installed in all our classrooms and offices. Further to, to the commingled recycling, nine streams as listed have been launched. Thus, the youth have the power to reduce landfill waste and improve recycling at their schools and homes. Brentwood actively takes part in the annual tree day every year by planting over 60 natives on the college grounds with the help from the Monash Council. Since we have run out of open space on the college grounds, we have started community tree planting since last year. The project Brentwood's campaign aims to offset nearly 24 tonnes of emissions every year. From an infrastructure perspective, Brentwood has installed a 98 kilowatt solar PV system, LED lighting, and energy efficient healing and cooling appliances. None of this will work if the community's behavior doesn't change. Brentwood staff and students have learned to conserve energy through many of the initiatives we promote, including Earth Hour, Earth Overshoot Day, etc. We celebrate the World's Ocean Day, say for the September and National Water Week to raise awareness on the importance of conserving water. We would like to leave you with this quote. Every young person is a piece of the jigsaw puzzle of change of improved communities, of better societies, and of sustainable and dynamic and dynamic world. We have the ability to power and shape the future for our, ourselves and this planet if we all work collaboratively. We hope we have inspired you today by providing you with some ideas to get started. So where are you going to start? For further information about our projects, please visit, visit our website. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, please email them to please email them to us at the website displayed here. I thank our speakers, Sadhana, Brendan, Nikhil, Arvind, Aeneas, and Katie for presenting today. Thank you, Brentwood College. I actually really, I thought that was really cool that you guys went around and uh, went around your uh, little room and your round table. Well, not really round table, but you know what I mean. 
No, guys, that was that was a really fantastic example of a um, of uh, of a group coming together and actually actually uh, to try and tackle a large a large task. Climate change is actually a what we call a wicked problem. It requires it requires multiple approaches because it spans more than one area: uh, waste, energy, biodiversity, all that. So, thank you very much for sharing for sharing uh, your group project there, Brentwood. Um, we are now going to break for lunch. Unfortunately, we did have an activity planned, but what I'm going to ask you all to do and what I encourage you all to do is that during your lunch break, we've heard some really inspirational stories from, from several different people and groups. What I want you to do now is while you're on break, have a think about, uh, have a think about the future that you guys want to create. Uh, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a conversation with a couple of people, the person next to you perhaps, okay? Uh, and for anyone following along with the journal, uh, you can you can fill this out on getting started on page eight. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. Any um, any questions or any insights uh, from your uh, from the future that you guys want to create? Throw them up in the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys back here soon.